thousand years. On the vertical axis here, we have the size of the human population uh, in billions of people. Over the last 10,000 years, in general, there's been very little change. It's a very boring picture. But from about the year 1800 onwards, you have a major increase, a very large increase in the world's population from about 1 billion up to 7 billion today. Basically, what this um, increase in population represents is um, control of death rates. Death rates have been reduced um, because um, infectious diseases, um, cholera, smallpox, malaria, um, measles, those sorts of things have been massively reduced. On average, for almost all of human history, um, a man and a woman were only survived into adulthood by two of their children. And basically, that's why the world's population didn't increase. Extending life by controlling disease is perhaps one of the greatest achievements of humanity. I was born in a world of two and a half billion, and I'm seeing it almost triple in my lifetime. And life has not gotten worse. In fact, for most of the population of the world, I've had, life has gotten better in these 50 years. Living healthily and long has consequences. Population growth. Just as the human population was starting its unprecedented growth spurt in the late 18th century, this was published. It's a first edition of an essay on population by the English clergyman Thomas Malthus. Malthus made a very simple observation about the relationship between humans and resources and used it to look into the future. He pointed out that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. Food production can't increase as rapidly as human reproduction. Demand will eventually outstrip supply. Malthus goes on to say, if we don't control human reproduction voluntarily, life could end in misery, which earned him a reputation as a bit of a pessimist. But Malthus's principle remains true. The productive capacity of the earth has physical limits, and those limits will ultimately determine how many human beings it can support. To help answer that question, we need to have an idea of what human beings need. And the people who calculate this more precisely than most are the people who are more interested in leaving the planet than staying on it. Astronauts. One of the people in charge of the well-being of astronauts on the International Space Station is Doug Hamilton. NASA, we calculate and simulate everything. If you're going to plan a rocket launch, you have to know how much food and water and uh, equipment you need to bring into space. As well as working out how much space the astronauts need, Doug and his team have to calculate their daily requirements for food, water and breathable air. They typically need about 820 grams of oxygen, which is just a really large, large balloon, really. Um, we need about uh, four to 5,000 calories of food, uh, which is about 820 grams dry, and then need about 3.52 liters of, uh, of water, of which two and a half liters is just consumed daily. We want them to drink a lot of water for them and then we urinate out and then we put that into our processing system and we make it into drinkable water. So you might be drinking the same water molecule hundreds and hundreds of times on the space station um, because we recycle. NASA's calculations are tailored for space. But they're the same ingredients each and every one of us needs. When you see how hard it is to reproduce what Mother Nature does every day for all of us, um, you begin to really appreciate the world that you have. Whatever our technological achievements, we're still utterly reliant on the natural systems of the Earth for our very survival. By and large, the planet has provided for the human race 
so far. As the population has increased, people through agriculture and industry have exploited those resources ever more effectively. But increasingly, we're seeing the signs of strain. We're reaching the limits of our environment. Perhaps most alarmingly, with that fundamental ingredient for life, water. We call our Earth the Blue Planet because about 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. But most of that is sea. Just 2.5% is fresh water. And of that tiny fraction, just 1% is available for human use. The rest is locked up in mountain glaciers and the Earth's polar ice caps. But there's another fact we need to understand about water. Well, there's no more water on the planet than there was when life first appeared on Earth. It changes its distribution. There's more water in different parts of the world than there were hundreds or thousands of years ago. But it's still exactly the same amount of water that's been here always. We appropriate over half of all the available fresh water in the world to serve our needs. To transform deserts into fields to generate energy from rivers and to build cities in some of the most arid regions on the planet. But despite our ingenuity, there are many who struggle to get enough of this basic resource. More than a billion people on the planet already lack access to safe, clean drinking water. And we know things are going to get more difficult as the population continues to grow. Within the next 20 years, as much as half of the world's population will live in areas of water stress. Chronic water shortages are often the result of poor infrastructure, politics, poverty, or simply living in an arid part of the world. But increasingly, the pressures of population are to blame. Mexico City is ranked as the eighth richest city in the world ahead of Moscow, Hong Kong, and Washington, D.C. It also benefits from heavy annual rainfall. But its water system is buckling under the pressure of supplying water to its 20 million inhabitants. And every day, at least a million people are affected by the shortages. Enrique Vasquez is a water truck driver for the government. And the number of people relying on this emergency service is growing daily. Today, he's heading for a poor district in the city's southwest, where he's a regular visitor. At some time in the future, wars are going to be fought over water, not oil. But people don't seem to understand. Instead of conserving it, we just waste it. The problem is a combination of leaks in the system and backup reservoirs that are running dry. The city authorities predict that these reservoirs may be completely emptied within a matter of months. Look, the tap's on, but there's no water coming out. The people living here have had to adapt their lifestyles to an erratic water supply. We only have half a bucket of water to wash ourselves with, and we can flush the toilet until two or three people have used it. Unfortunately, I 